Well, uh, now we are discussing about lysosomal storage disorders. They are a very rare group of inborn errors of metabolism that involve uh, the accumulation of non-degraded material inside a, a very special organelle in the cell called lysosome. The lysosomes, they are very interesting uh, organelles because they have the a role of recycling all the material that's uh, degrade, that, that should be degraded inside the, the cell. It's very important because when you recycle this material, it can be used for uh, building new membranes, building new structures, and building uh, the energy factor of the cell. But uh, there are some disorders that involve the metabolism of the lysosomes. These disorders called generically lysosomal storage diseases, they are quite rare, at least we have about 50, uh, between 50 and 60 of these diseases. But as a group, they're not so rare. If you think about it, the, the frequency can be one in, in every 4,000 uh, newborns. It's important to recognize the clinical phenotype of these diseases because some of them have uh, available therapies, but the, as they are progressive diseases, the sooner you begin, the better for the patient. And sometimes, although you cannot cure the patient, you can offer them the possibility of uh, uh, the correct uh, management and the correct follow-up and the genetic counseling of the family. Well, uh, when you talk about this uh, complex structure called uh, lysosome and this uh, interaction between other diseases, it's important to notice that when you have a lysosome disease, you usually are leading with multi-complex disorders involving a whole branch of uh, systems. And we can have, like example, the uh, mucopolysaccharidosis. Mucopolysaccharidosis are a group well known of uh, lysosomal storage diseases uh, in which we have the accumulation of glycosaminoglycans. They are very important to build up the, the conjunctive uh, tissue, the endothelial tissue, and the, uh, the cartilages. So there are diseases that involve the a whole organism as, a, a, as a, a, a whole. It's a very important to know that there are several different types of MPS, each depend on the, the specific enzyme uh, that are uh, deficient in these diseases. And it's important to, uh, to evaluate these disorders doing uh, an algorithm diagnosis. Usually you can start uh, doing analysis in urine and blood samples from the patient. Usually in urine you do some qualitative and quantitative studies doing the, uh, a thin layer chromatography to see the type of gag that's accumulating or you study the, the amount of the gags. And usually it this guide you, guides you to do the molecular and the biochemical analysis of the enzyme that's deficient. So you can classify NMPS1, 2, 3, 4, and so on. Well, when you are uh, uh, facing a lysosomal storage disease, you are facing a special group of metabolic disorders that are progressive. You don't have a metabolic discompensation like you see in other inborn errors of metabolism. And they are usually, uh, the patient usually does not have signs of the disease when they are born, but then they develop progressive uh, facial coarsen features or signs of storage disease like in the uh, liver or the spleen or in the brain. They are not very specific symptoms for those disorders, but usually you have to think in a, in a lysosomal storage disease when you have uh, uh, some special features, so, such as visceromegaly, uh, progressive dementia, corneal opacification, visceromegaly and coarsen facial features, epile myoclonic epilepsy, uh, 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 dementia accompanied by eye movement disorders. So there are some clinical hints that you can uh, combine in the evaluation of a patient with suspicion of lysosomal disease, especially if you have some kind of some types of uh, stream presentations, like in the non-hydropsy fatalis presentation. This is a kind of uh, extremes uh, presentation of the lysosomal diseases. Well, we start with a study case that's a patient that was referred for evaluation when, with three years old. He was referred because of uh, some developmental delay, especially in speech, and some special facial features. The mother referred that the, the, the patient had some delay in language. He had several uh, 
airways infection, threat infections like uh, sinusitis, otitis. And he had some um, uh, difficulties to, to breathe and he had to, to uh, stay with the mouth open and he had, according to the mother, a very uh, large tongue. Well, when you evaluate this kind of patient, pay, pay, pay attention for the facial features of the patient. At the physical exam, you can see some uh, visceral megaly, special, especially hepatomegaly. You see the coarse facial features. You see some uh, contractures and uh, large joints. And you see a little bit of claw hand. These are very, very uh, uh, su su suggestive signs of MPS. In a patient like that, we should uh, uh, refer to a clinical uh, biochemical geneticist or, or a, a metabolic pediatrician that can proceed with the follow-up of the patient. Usually, we ask for the analysis of the gags in urine, uh, quantitative and qualitative, to see the type of gags in this patient. You have an uh, increase of the total ga gags and accumulation of dermatin sulfate and aparan sulfate that can very that can be very specific for MPS type 1. So we usually order the enzyme testing based on, on this combination of features, and this patient had a decrease of the activity of the alpha during the days. So we have the presentive diagnosis of MPS type 1. Usually, in, uh, when you manage, manage a patient with MPS, you should pay attention for the, the need for clinical uh, and genetic counseling of the family because they are mostly recessive diseases with exception of the MPS2 that's an excellent disorder. You have to, f to, to offer the family the symptomatic treatment of the child, uh, better evaluate him for uh, prevention of uh, other aspects of the disease, and especially in some selected cases, you can have the option of doing bone marrow transplant or enzyme replacement therapy. In the case of a patient with MPS uh, in general, uh, there is a need to do several surgeries, especially tonsillectomy, adenectomy. Some patients with very, uh, very increase of corneal pacification. You should uh, consider the corneal transplantation. Some patients need to have repairs of or inguinal and umbilical hernias, and other patient can need may need assistance to, to breathe. So sleep studies and use of CPAP can be indicated in these cases. When you have a patient with MPS1, for example, there's an available specific therapy with enzyme repression therapy that should be offered to the patient as a, an ag uh, adjunctive therapy together with the support of the palliative care. Uh, in some uh, severe case of MPS1, the horror type, usually you need to do the bone marrow transplant to protect the brain of the child because these patients, they, uh, even though they are on uh, enzyme replacement therapy, they you develop a cognitive decline. So only the bone marrow can prevent that. And usually we advise to do it uh, before two years of age. Moving around, we have a, a different case now. It's an older patient. And we know that lysosomal storage disease can appear in toddlers and, uh, and younger uh, teenagers or even adult patients. This patient has an uh, interesting history. She was a 16 years old girl that had some learning difficulties around 9 years of age. And then she developed some psychiatric problems when she, she was in, uh, in her teen age. Uh, these psychiatric problems, they are accompanied by uh, uh, worsen of the cognitive uh, impairment of the patient, and she had a, a refractory uh, uh, response to the antipsychotics they tried to study her. Uh, when she was referred to us, uh, she doesn't have coarsen or dysmorphic features like the other patient, but you can evaluate in the neuro neurological examination that she had uh, an ophthalmological vertical eye gaze paralysis that can be very su suggestive of some uh, lysosomal diseases, neurolipidosis in this case. She had also a mild splenomegaly that was later confirmed with ultrasound, and she had some ataxia. And you, when you see her walking, you can su see that she had some um, a dystonic posture of the hands. So when you have patient with this combination of psychiatric changes, uh, eye movement disorders, and uh, some degree of visceromegaly, especially 
splenomegaly, you, you probably are facing a lysosomal uh, storage disease with brain involvement. We have different types of this involvement, uh, like in Gaucher type 3 and uh, Nima Peak type A, B, and Nima Peak type C, and other rare, more rare like uh, mucolipidosis. But if you combine the signs of the patient, the eye, the eye movement problem, the normal fundus opticus, the cerebrotaxia with the dystonia, the splenomegaly, the cognitive decline, the dementia, you will be leading to a specific diagnosis of Nima Peak type C. In these cases, you, you need to do uh, specific testing called Philippine staining, that you see the accumulation of free cholesterol that's a, a, a pra practically pathognomonic of the disease yeah, uh, in skin fibroblasts that are cultivated. You later can confirm this diagnosis using molecular biology to see mutations in NPC1 or NPC2 genes. Pneumopic type C is a very complex disorder, a combination of neurological and visceral megaly. Uh, many, many late onset presentations do not have the visceral megaly. Sometimes even only a mild spinal megaly that can be, can be detectable by uh, abnormal ultrasound. But other patients, they only have the neurological deterioration that's progressive with time. Usually, you can have a broad range of manifestation. Some patients with severe forms of anima pig type C can have the hydropsis fatalis presentation or ascites or fulminant liver disease, but most of the patients have a, a, a neurological presentation that is insidious in many patients. It can uh, take years to fully develop the, the, the complete spectrum of the disease. In this case, uh, when you have a neurological uh, symptoms of pneumopic type C, it's indicated the substrate reduction therapy in, you, in which you use a, a small molecule called Migustat that can decrease the accumulation of the glycosphingolipids in the brain of these patients. Usually, the sooner you start the treatment, you can have a stabilization or you can slow the progression of the disease. So, uh, Nima Pic Type C and MPS1 are examples of the, the great vi variety and variability that we have in the lysosomal storage diseases. They are complex disorders with uh, specific features and sometimes uh, not, not, not so specific characteristics, and their diagnosis is a challenge, but it's necessary to have an early diagnosis on those patients because in, in selected patients, there is a specific therapy, and uh, for the others, the genetic counseling and the correct management of the patient are essential for the family and the good health of the, the person affected by these rare diseases.